Hi, and welcome to Barry Aftercare, the podcast, the video, whatever you're watching. This is Barry Aftercare, and I am Dr. Connie Stapleton. Most of you probably know me by now, but if you don't, I am a licensed psychologist and I have been working in the field of bariatric medicine for the past ooh, 17 years, probably. Anyway, I love this field and I love it because I think that weight loss surgery is an amazing opportunity for people to get weight off that they've struggled with for so, so, so long. But as each and every one of you may know, <laughs> or probably know, or will know, keeping the weight off after weight loss surgery is not always an easy task because you've got to change the lifestyle. Uh, I know you get sick of hearing that, right? It seems very trite. It sounds very bleh, but it's the truth. So today we're going to talk about one of the psychological issues related to keeping that weight off and what the problem might be. And today's topic is called obsession with food as survival. Now, what does that mean? Well, several months ago or several weeks ago or a while ago, however long ago it was, we talked about... Um, the issues that underlie sometimes keeping weight off. Um, and it can be difficult and it's psychological in a lot of ways. And there can be a lot of layers. But for people who have gained and lost, gained and lost, gained and lost, there are sometimes deeper issues at play. And one of them may be that food has been a survival mechanism. Now, I know I read a really long article some weeks back about some physicians in California who did a big study and they talked about food as a survival mechanism for some people. But I want to talk today about this topic in a little bit different light. Ironically, in a little bit different light <laughs> comes to mind because some of what I'm going to be sharing with you comes from an amazing book called Eating in the Light of the Moon. And it's written by a psychologist or a PhD named Anita A. Johnston. And seriously, this is one of a few books that I've read over my career working in bariatrics that I think, my gosh, I wish I had written this book. It is truly amazing, has some deep wisdom in it, and I know that people are going to relate to the information in this book. I've been taking quotes and paragraphs from this book and posting them on various Facebook groups. And people are really, really relating to this. But it's just about where does this obsession with food come from? And as you know, hopefully you know, that weight loss surgery does not take care of the obsession with food. Now, you may have heard something contrary to that. And that's because for about the first year, year and a half, there's a whole lot of chemistry taking place in your body, not only in your gut region, but also in your brain. And a lot of people finally feel like there's some freedom from that obsession with food. And that is such a, such a, such an amazing gift. However, <laughs> the struggle is that for a lot of people, that obsession starts to return in about a year and a half, two years. I have a good friend, two good friends in New Zealand, where I've had the pleasure to go and work on a couple of different occasions over the years. And the husband is a bariatric surgeon, Dr. David Schroeder, and his wife, Andrea Schroeder, is a nurse, and she's the manager of their program. They have probably the most thorough, comprehensive program that I've ever seen. And they do a lot of work. In fact, part of their program is every single patient it comes to a retreat for a five-day retreat where they learn a lot about you know, mindfulness and negative thinking and the importance of positive self-talk and just a myriad of different topics. But they really talk about understanding a lot of these deeper issues. So I want to, through Barry Aftercare, 
do a lot of that kind of educating you guys about some of these different issues. So we're going to talk about what this obsession with food is. But the reason I brought up David and Andrea is because David is the one who kind of helped me understand that after a person has bariatric surgery, it's like a gate in the brain shuts for the first time in what may seem like forever. And there's a quietness that obsession with food kind of subsides. And during this time, while the body is going through all of these changes, that first year, year and a half referred to commonly as the honeymoon period is when a person has the opportunity to develop that, you know, that trite but true phrase of developing that healthy lifestyle. What that means is engaging in the behaviors that the dietitian has shared with you, making the changes, developing the schedule, looking into some things you need to look into, whether it's, you know, learning to refrain from emotional eating or setting timers on your phone to remind you when to eat or becoming a breakfast person when you're not, whatever it is you have to do. It's this first year and year and a half that you work your butt off to establish these habits. Because as Dr. Schroeder says, after about a year and a half to two years, that gate that has quieted your mind from the obsession with food slowly reopens. Surgery does not fix underlying issues related to your habits, your relationship with food. So this book that I'm reading, Eating in the Light of the Moon, talks a lot about some of the purposes that this obsession with food might serve for you. So I just want to share with you what Dr. Anita Johnston is talking about in her book, and it's really, really quite brilliant. So some of what she talks about is that a lot of times when somebody develops an obsession with, with food, it's a substitute for other things going on in their life, right? So they develop this obsession with food because it takes away from what's going on here. For example, she describes the fact that a lot of people who have obsessions with food are very perceptive individuals. They are very wise. They can look at situations and they can see that, you know, maybe things in this household aren't exactly as they seem. You know, everybody's saying everything's fine, but I'm witnessing some, you know, ugly interactions between people. Or if I go to somebody and say, this bad thing is happening in my family and I'm told it's not, children start to question themselves. And they question that the, what they're perceiving is not the truth, even though it feels to them like, but I see this. Doesn't anybody else see what's going on here, right? But what that does is it brings ridicule or it brings about rejection or, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. That is not happening here. Don't you dare tell anybody about that. This is not something we talk about outside of our home. And so children who experience that kind of thing often start to doubt themselves, right? So in order to kind of survive, right? It's like, I can't be who I am. I can't talk about what I'm really seeing or what I'm really experiencing or what I'm witnessing. I have to quiet this voice because I have been told or shown that I better not speak what I see going on here. And so this, this sense of how things are lead to this kid not feeling like they fit in, right? I, you know, it's like something's wrong with me, right? Something's wrong with me. Clearly, I'm not seeing things the way the other people are in this house, and I'm told to shut up about them. So if I want to be accepted in my family, I'm kind of going to go along with them. And children need to be accepted, loved, to fit in by their family, right? So I'm going to go with the flow. I'm going to keep quiet about what I see going on here. I'm going to pretend that never happened. I'm going to th pretend things are just fine here, right? Because 
clearly I can't trust myself. If these adults who I have to trust and I have to rely on because kids can't survive on their own, right? If they tell me that I'm wrong, I must be wrong. So, so kids learn to quiet that voice of reason, their guidance, their intuition, right? And they start shooting on themselves. Well, I should do what mommy says, or I shouldn't tell anybody, or I should just keep my mouth shut. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't, you know, talk about what's going on here. So the emotions related to the things that she somewhere knows are true get quieted, right? And so there's this kind of switching that takes place. The person kind of distances themselves from their truth, from their knowing what's going on. And they have this hunger. They have this hunger for their truth, for this wisdom. But they can't talk about what it really is. And so they feel like this hunger is physical. So they become obsessed with food. They start filling this hunger, which is really not about physical appetite. It's about spiritual longing. It's about emotional hunger. It's about emotional connection. And it's a hunger to connect with people as I really am. But I've been told how I really am and what I really perceive isn't really what I should be talking about. So we stuff this down and yet we feel this yearning, this hunger. So I try to fill that up. I try to fill that up. So it must be that I'm hungry. So maybe I start to become compulsive about eating. And maybe I just feel like there's nothing I can do to fill up. I feel like I have this insatiable appetite. And then throughout the life of this person, they feel like, you know, there's just something wrong with me. You know, if I see things a certain way and nobody else does, <laughs> clearly it's me, right? So the struggle with food, the issues with food confirm this. I've got a problem with food. I want to eat all the time. I'm hungry all the time. Or I seem to need more food than other people. And food seems to do something for me that other people don't. So you know what? The struggle with food confirms what I already have come to know. There's something wrong with me. Now, this isn't conscious. This doesn't happen, you know, consciously in the mind of a child. They can't think that consciously. And we've talked in, in weeks previous, many weeks ago, about trauma and abuse and things like that as a child. These are kind of related, maybe not necessarily, but maybe something's going on where the child learns to doubt themselves. And so they think something's wrong with me. They get that message somewhere. And gee, you know, if I can't think it's my mind or I can't think, you know, something's wrong with everybody else out there because I see what's going on and they don't, well, then let's make the food be the problem. Something's wrong with me and everybody can see it because I have a problem with food. Doesn't fill me up. I need more of it. I think about it all the time. So in order to overcome this, then what we've got to do is kind of look inwardly, you know, and say, you know, I've got to look at how I think and what I believe about things in the world, even if other people don't. And I've got to start to learn to use my voice. And I quieted that voice a long time ago. But I need to look at what happened in my life. And I need to talk about what happened in my life. So a lot of times in bariatric evaluations, I hear things like, you know what? I was sexually abused and I told my mother and she told me never to talk about that again. Or, you know, I was being bullied at school and nobody came to my rescue. My parents said, just deal with it or the teacher's right, or there's nothing I can do. Or they might say, you know, I'm worried about you know, my mom and dad, they seem to be fighting all the time. And the parents are, don't tell anybody about what's going on in this house or there might be an addiction going on. And so the person is quieted, right? So to 
lose this obsession with food, which has become an ingrained part of this person's life, they have to start doing the deep dive, which is why I have the class Gain While You Lose that I do two or three times a year because it helps you to start looking at the deeper relationship that food plays with self-esteem and with questioning yourself and with looking at, is there a relationship between my obsession with food and things that happened in my life? It's also something I do at the retreats that I have. I just completed two retreats and I mean to tell you, these women at these retreats did amazing work and started to look at how this obsession with food formed when things were going awry and they could no longer trust themselves. And it's easier to be obsessed with food than the fact that I was being sexually abused and nobody protected me. Or there was a lot of addiction and abuse going on in my home and there was nobody I could tell about it. Or I just didn't feel normal around the other kids and, you know, whatever it was, whatever it was. So you got to learn to look at your own story with compassion and understanding and an absolute truth that there's nothing wrong with anybody, you, me, any of the kids, right? The disordered eating behavior does not say I'm a faulty person, right? What it says is I need some help. I need some help. There's nothing wrong with me, but I need to heal my relationship with myself and my relationship with food. So we have to accept into in healing from this that the obsession with food or weight or grams or protein or carbs or the scale and all that insanity that's like putting our hands around our eyes and having limited vision. All we focus on is food and food related things, right? It's an obsession. Weight loss surgery doesn't heal that obsession. So we got to look at this obsession and not see it as a horrible character defect. Oh my God, there's something so horrible with me. But rather, hmm, think of it this way. Did this obsession with food protect me from something? Was it a protective mechanism? Now you might be able to rate, relate to this in this way. Emotional eating, right? So many of you say, I'm an emotional eater, I'm an emotional eater. So emotional eating is nothing more than a protection. It's an emotional coping skill. It's not something inherently wrong with you. Who you are, how you behave in life, it's not a character defect. It's a protection from what? Well, we'll talk about that. It's something you've learned in your lifetime, food makes me feel better, at least temporarily. If I eat, I won't deal with this. If I'm thinking about this and this and this and this and this and this related to food and I'm watching the Food Network and I'm looking at recipes 20 hours a day and then I'm not having to deal with this, right? So let's take a look at this obsession with food as maybe, just maybe, being something that developed as a way to help you deal with emotional distress. Maybe about feeling different, maybe about feeling misunderstood, maybe about feeling not accepted at school, or maybe just by feeling overwhelmed in life, right? Maybe this pattern of disordered eating and obsession on food, you know, maybe it provided a way to deal with things that were out of your control or too big for a child to handle. Now, I'm going to read this, this paragraph from this book. Again, the book is called Eating in the Light of the Moon. And it will help you understand how maybe food has been a survival technique. So the author, Anita Johnston, says, Imagine yourself standing in the rain on the bank of a raging river. Suddenly, the water-swollen bank gives way. You fall into the raging river and find yourself being tossed around in the rapids. Your efforts to stay afloat are futile and you are drowning. By chance, 
along comes a huge log and you grab it and you hold on tight. The log keeps your head above water and saves your life. Clinging to the log, you're swept downstream and eventually you come to a place where the water is calm. There in the distance, you see the river bank and you attempt to swim to shore. You're unable to do so, however, because you're still clinging to the huge long with one arm while you stroke with the other arm trying to get to shore. How ironic. The very thing that saved your life, the log, is now getting in the way of you getting to where you want to go. There are people on the shore who see you struggling. They say, let go of the log. But you're unable to do so because you don't have confidence in your ability to get to shore. That's sort of what's it like, what it's like for so many people. Because now that you've had weight loss surgery and you're learning skills and tools, maybe you don't trust yourself to let go of this obsession, right? Maybe you're you're like looking at this and go, what is, what is wrong with me? That this obsession with food continues in my life. Well, maybe like the person who held onto the log that's now preventing them from getting where they want to be, right? You want to be healthy. You want to be off medications. You want to do things that you want to do in life. But you're terrified of letting go of this obsession because maybe it was a way of survival for you. Maybe it was a way like the log to keep your head above water during some rough times. Maybe it was conflict in the family. Maybe it was feelings within yourself. Maybe it was difficult situations, right? So maybe we hang on to this destructive behavior because you think there's something wrong with you when really it's something you sought to help you through a hard time. And, you know, there are people on the outside going, stop doing it. Push away from the table. Stop starving yourself. Stop binging. Stop purging. But you don't trust yourself to get to the shore where you want to be. So it's scary, right? So if you let go of the shore or the log, let's say you're in the water again and you let go of the log and you get part way, but you didn't have enough strength, now you're really stuck because you don't have enough strength to get back to the log and you don't have enough strength to get to the side, right? So you might feel silly hanging onto the log or you might feel silly hanging onto this obsession with the food and people don't understand it and they get frustrated with you, right? But this recovery process from this obsession with food, you've got to honor the fear of letting it go, not beat yourself up. Why don't I just let this go? Why am I having such a hard time with emotional eating? Why can't I just? Why can't I just? Why can't I just? While other people are saying the same thing, right? Maybe having some compassion for yourself and saying, there's a reason I'm having a hard time letting this go, right? There's a reason that I'm holding on to this. This serves a purpose. So a lot of times in my therapy group, I also do an online therapy group that you can join if you're really struggling with changing your behaviors so that you're able to maintain your weight loss. And you can, you know, email me, cstapletonphd at gmail.com if you want to be part of this group or any of the programs that I offer. But you know what? Maybe if you look at this and go, how has this helped me? How has this served me? I don't have to beat myself up and saying, I'm really a loser. There's nothing I can do. Why bother? All that stuff. So by looking at this and going, you know what? Maybe I need to thank this obsession with food because it might have saved me from something pretty traumatic that I didn't have the skills to deal with once upon a time. So knowing what I need to develop, maybe I need to develop trust in other people. Maybe I need to develop 
the ability to ask for help. Maybe I need to develop some healthy coping skills. Maybe I need to develop a way to deal with my anger or my sadness or my fear or my losses. And when you can do that, you can start letting go of the log and swim safely to shore. I know it sounds really bizarre and a lot of people don't understand it, but it's interesting because in that article that we went through many weeks ago, we learned that this weight obsession has helped a lot of people maybe avoid unwanted sexual advances. If I'm overweight, they don't bother me with that. Maybe there's a history of sexual abuse and so I don't want any sexual advances. Now I want health and I want wellness. I want off these medications and I want to be thinner, but I've got this conflict, right? I don't want sexual attention, but I want to be healthier and at a healthier weight. So dealing with the issue of the sexual abuse can help you to let go of that log and be able to cope with life, right? Learning to address the feelings related to the sexual abuse and maybe talking about the fact that this dieting has helped me avoid dealing with that or avoid dealing with the fact that people, you know, told me, don't talk about it. So we have to develop the skills, right? But in order to develop the skills, you have to know what the problems are, right? But the development of these skills take the place of holding on to that log or holding on to this obsession with food. It's like, oh, once I realize that I can find people who will help me and understand and I can let go a little bit and then I'm going to cling back on because I'm really afraid as I do this, but I'll develop more skills and then I can let go. And it becomes more and more efficient to deal with life's issues as you learn how to develop trust, as you learn how to trust your voice and speak your voice and speak your mind, as you learn how to set boundaries with people, as you learn how to say, I'm not going to live in this world of denial that the rest of my family chooses to live in about whatever the family secrets were. We can let go of this obsession with food. You can let go of the log relying on these skills. So it's a process. You hang on, you learn more skills. You loosen your grip, you learn more skills. Very slowly, very carefully. You might grab back on now and then when the emotions get too big or the fear gets too big and that's okay. But it begins with understanding that in some way or some ways, this obsession with food served you in a time you needed to survive, like the log. And understanding this, having compassion for yourself, being grateful that you chose something to survive, and then developing the new skills so that you don't need to survive anymore. You don't need to survive. You, you can live. You can live fully. You can do all those things you want to do. It's a gradual step-by-step -step process, right? You got to let go of judgment. You got to let go of this thought that there's something wrong with me and maybe say, you know what? I hate this compulsion with food. I hate this obsession with food, but I'm going to be grateful because it did help me survive at one point in time. But I'm going to choose and give myself permission to let go of it and learn healthier skills. And that is a chapter in this amazing book called Eating in the Light of the Moon by Anita Johnston. And this chapter is called The Beginning, Revisioning the Struggle. So I hope that this gave you some insight. And again, I really encourage you to get this book and to read it and to think about the amazing insight she has. And then in order to deal with the issues, join Gain While You Lose. Look it up on my website, ConnieStapletonPhD.com. Come to one of my retreats, FairAndFirmRetreats.com. Participate in my online group therapy. There are ways 
Go to your support groups. Go to AA. Go to NA. Go to OA. I don't care. Just get whatever help you need. Start by looking online. How to learn healthy coping skills. How to avoid emotional eating. There's all kinds of great ways for you to learn. So I hope that you will dig in, dive deep, and learn what you need to learn. And I also want to put a plug in for another really great podcast called um, Weight Loss Surgery Success. And it's Dr. Susan Mitchell. And it's a very short 10-minute podcast. So it's a great thing. And she includes me in the podcast from time to time because while she's a dietitian and I'm a psychologist, our work goes hand in hand. So I want to give a shout out to her. She's got a good, good thing going. She's a good woman. All right. And as always, I want to remind you, your health is your responsibility. So take advantage of that and join Barry Aftercare, the full program. All right. Look it up, barryaftercare.com. And I will talk with you soon. I thank you for being, you know, being courageous enough to look at some of your issues. And I will see those of you who are part of Barry Aftercare on Thursday as we continue with this topic. Make it a great one, friends.